Would you open your Bibles this morning with me? You know what book we're going to? The book of Revelation, chapter 2. This morning's text comes from verses 8 through 11. Revelation 2, 8 through 11. It says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you who are rich, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, would you bless the words that are about to come from my mouth? Would they be straight from your heart? And would we be open to how they might change us this morning? Amen. So apparently there's a pretty big football game today. Does anybody plan on watching it? A few of us? What's that? Yeah, Colts game is, uh, I don't know about that, but the Chargers aren't in it anymore. And so there are others of us in this room who are a little more sad than the Cowboys fans in this room. But for that sake, like I said, I'm going to try to keep this short and to the point because I don't want you to have to be distracted by the stress you might be feeling as you're looking at the clock. Just don't even look at it. You're going to have to trust me this morning. Well, this morning we're continuing our sermon series, Refocusing the Apocalypse. We're talking about the book of Revelation and looking at how, how much of an impact it has when we look at the book of Revelation through a filter of hope instead of a filter of fear. So particularly, one of the points that I want us to walk away this morning with is this idea that our perspective of our goals has this profound way of impacting our actions. Or as we might look at the book of Revelation, we might say something like, our view of what God's goals are really shapes the way we live our lives here in the present. Now, we've all experienced in some form or fashion having goals that didn't line up with somebody else's, right? Whether that's in business or in your relationships or just in everyday life, sometimes here in the church. And and when we recognize that different goals shape different definitions of, of success, then sometimes it helps us get on the same page as far as whose goal we're really following. And so that really becomes the question, is who is it that defines what the goal is? If our goals shape the definition of success, if our goals shape our present actions, then whose goals are we actually striving for? Well, as we talk about football, this brings back some memories of my own illustrious football career, believe it or not. I did play football, organized. My career, I would like to say, ended with some sort of injury that forced me to retire or something else of that sort, but really it was just kind of lack of size and skill, if we're honest. And it ended in the eighth grade. I played football sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. But I have to also explain that the football program that I was a part of was a lot different than what we're used to here in Texas. Uh, in California, Northern California, where I grew up, we started football in, in sixth grade in the schools. We didn't start in preschool like some Texans here, I think, might. And I know that some Texans haven't heard of this before, but for some reason, my school didn't play tackle football. We played flag football. And so in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I was on the school flag football team, and it didn't go past eighth grade. You see, I had this problem. I played wide receiver because I could run. And when we were practicing, I could catch. But the problem was, when it came time for the game, for some reason my hands would just turn to butter. 
And I can vividly picture that feeling of running downfield and looking over my shoulder and seeing the ball coming right toward me. And I would begin this inner dialogue in my head, looking at that ball saying, oh no, here it comes. It's coming to me. I better catch this. My family's watching. Everybody else is watching. There's no way I'm going to catch this. And by the time it got to me, I'd already determined my own fate, and I wouldn't catch it. My nerves would get the best of me. The stress and the pressure of that split second from the time that the ball was thrown to the time when it actually reached my hands, that was just too much for me. And I, I would get inside my head and I would drop the ball. I had a pattern of this. Well, I also remember one time in the sixth grade when the coach put me in at the end of the game and he called a pass play in my direction. And I was as nervous as I'll get out. And I went through those same pattern of motions. The ball was hiked, I began to run downfield, the ball was thrown, I looked back, I had that same dialogue going on in my head that lasted two seconds, but in my head lasted ten minutes. But this time when the ball reached my hands, I caught it. And I was so surprised that I kind of just stopped for a quick second. But that short second was just long enough for the defender to get my flag And for the play to be down. And as soon as I reached the sidelines, my teammates were like, Josh, you could have scored a touchdown. You were wide open. You had that guy beat. And in a time when I got to the sidelines and maybe should have been embarrassed that I didn't score a touchdown. Or or should have been humiliated that I was distracted by the fact that I actually caught the ball. I was excited. I caught the ball. It didn't matter to me that I didn't run the rest of the way to score a touchdown. It didn't matter that the play stopped right then and there. I caught the ball. And for me, I felt like I had just won the game. You see, my goal had been accomplished. I hadn't necessarily accomplished the goals of my teammates, but my goal defined my success. And in that moment, in that place, I was a success. Our perspective of future goals shapes our definitions of success. Or you can think about today's football game. If the Cowboys win the game 3 to 0 today, some of us will be excited and we'll call that a victory. And technically, a win is a win. All you need is to have one more point than the opponent. And if the goal is to just win the game, then yes, that would be a successful game. But if the goal is to entertain your fans while you win, then others of us would look at that game and say, that wasn't that successful. Our perspective of the goal shapes our definitions of success and in turn shapes our present actions. Okay, so why all this talk about about football and about perspective? Well, this is exactly how we paint the picture with the church in Smyrna. If you remember last week, we talked about the city of Ephesus. Well, Smyrna was kind of similar to Ephesus. There's a couple things unique about Smyrna. It was another town of of hustle and bustle and prominence. And it was actually one of, of, of the seven letters that are written at the beginning of Revelation. Smyrna is the only town that is still in existence. It's not called Smyrna anymore. It's called Izmir. It's in Turkey. This is on the west coast of Turkey. And so just like Ephesus that we talked about last week, it was a port town. It had a lot of things and people and influences coming and going. But one thing that's unique about Smyrna is that at one point in its history, it was completely destroyed. And it wasn't until 300 years later that the Roman Empire rebuilt the city of Smyrna. brought it back to life, really. And turned it into a city of prominence. And so they built temples and libraries and and stadiums and arenas so that all of Smyrna's neighbors would be envious of the city of Smyrna. And as a result, all of the citizens of Smyrna praised the Roman Empire for bringing this dead city back to life. And so it's no coincidence 
That the writer of Revelation says these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. He makes that connection with the city of Smyrna. The only difference is the resurrection of Smyrna came from the Roman Empire and not from God. Historians and archaeologists point out that within the city of Smyrna, or surrounding the city rather, there was this line of buildings. And in the center of this line of buildings on the hills that surrounded Smyrna was the Acropolis, or the the citadel overlooking the city. And ancient poets actually referred to this as the crown of Smyrna. So as enemies or even just as guests approached the coastline of Smyrna and they looked atop those hills, they saw what was this physical crown of Smyrna. And so again, we see this language that the author of the book of Revelation that John uses here when he says, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. It's no mistake that those specific words are used when this language of of the crown of Smyrna would have been so familiar. Now you have to imagine. You have to imagine how difficult it would have been to be a Christian in the city of Smyrna. To exist as a Christian within a city that has for years now worshipped the Roman Empire and praised the empire for bringing it out of the ashes, for bringing it back to life. To refuse to participate in the practices of the city took incredible courage because doing so meant being an outcast. It meant giving up your resources. It meant public and social humiliation. But in the midst of this persecution, God encourages the church and says, be courageous and remain faithful. Now, how does God do that? By showing the church in Smyrna whose goal is really defining success. You see, success as defined by the Roman Empire was wealth and prosperity, the worship of Caesar and of of the imperial cult and the, the gods of the empire. From the perspective of the empire, the victory was already there, and they couldn't understand why these Christians weren't taking advantage of it. But God's definition of success, God's goals, God's sense of victory is different. You see, the crown of life, as opposed to the crown of Smyrna, is awarded to those who have the courage to swim upstream when everyone else is going with the flow. And when the goal is different, so is that definition of success. Now, God could have told the church in Smyrna to to hunker down and hide or to find some way to escape what they were going through, but he didn't. The church in Smyrna is told to remain courageous, to live faithfully within the context in which they've been placed. In the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of this social humiliation, the church is called to be courageous and to remain faithful. Now, we can learn a lot from the church in Smyrna, right? I mean, we can't begin to imagine what it would be like to worship in a, in a place where we are looked down on or, or even in fear of our lives for worshiping openly like could have happened in Smyrna, but we know also happens currently in corners of the globe. But then doesn't that make our call even stronger to remain as faithful Christians when we do live in a society that allows us to worship openly? Not as Christians who hunker down and hide and and not as Christians who try to, to run and escape, but Christians who live faithfully in the midst of the context in which we've been placed. Now this letter to Smyrna also helps us understand the entire book of Revelation. 
When we read the book of Revelation through that filter of fear, then we're looking for those promises of escape. But when we read the book of Revelation through this lens, through this lens of hope and of courage, then we recognize that God calls the church to remain present and God calls the church to be strong, to not lose sight of its original calling as we talked about last week, to love God and to love others. As we refocus the apocalypse, We recognize that the book of Revelation is a lot less about a plan to escape this world and a lot more about how to remain faithful in the midst of it. This last week I was driving home from work with Emily in the car and the car seat behind me. And you have to understand, Emily hates when the sun gets in her eyes. She's 22 months. And so as we're driving, I, I hear this familiar call from the back seat, too much sun, too much sun. And so I, I turn around briefly, and I see her trying to duck away from the sun that was in her eyes. Interestingly, she couldn't see what I could see. What I saw as I turned around was the line of the sun was right about here. And so from here down, it was sunny. But from here up, it was shady. Now her natural reaction when that sun got in her eyes was to hunker and to hide. But what she didn't realize is that every time she tried to escape what was happening, she was actually making it worse. When in reality, what was to bring her relief was to sit up taller, sit up straighter so that she would remain in the shade. You see, I had perspective that she did not. And while the instructions I gave her were counter to her natural reaction, it was only when she finally trusted me to sit up straight did she find that relief from the sun that was getting in her eyes. You see where I'm going with this? It's the exact same thing with us. We go through life and we have these things that are beating us down. And we think if we can only run and hide from them or if we can find some secret way to escape all this, then we'll be good. And yet we don't have the perspective that God has. And so every time we try to duck and to escape what is happening in our life, sometimes we're just making it worse. When in reality, God is saying, sit up tall. Have courage. The straighter you sit up, the more relief you will find. Trust me and trust my perspective. Is it easy? Not at all. In fact, the more that we pretend that living a faithful Christian life in this world is easy, we simply do ourselves a disservice. Was it easy for the church in Smyrna? No. Was it easy for any church that existed throughout that book of Revelation and how the book of Revelation speaks to us today? No. But when we trust God's perspective above our own, we find ourselves doing things that are counter to our human nature. And yet when we stand up in confidence, we find that somehow life is bringing us this sense of peace that we could not imagine if we were trying to do it our own way. God sets the victory. God sets the goal. And when we align our definitions of success with what God has in mind, then our actions are shaped toward that perfect future. Be strong. Be courageous. Be encouraged this morning because God will bring the victory. Amen? Amen. Amen.